If you look at the history of Western medicine, going back to Greco-Roman days, there's been basically two schools of thought. One school of thought is the what's called the Sclepian school of thought, and the other is the hygienic or Gaia school of thought. So the one school of thought was the body makes mistakes, the body is a victim of the environment, we're all the doctors to take control and fix things. The other school of thought, the hygiene school of thought, is the body has tremendous ability to heal, and the role of the doctors understand what's blocking the body from healing and support the natural healing processes. If you look at the history of medicine, the pendulum swung back and forth, back and forth. And in reality, right now is we have a system which has been dominated for over almost 100 years now by that conventional doctor take control, use drugs, the body makes mistakes, and take control, be, be authoritarian there. Um, whereas the other school of thought has been politically uh, and socially and financially suppressed. The best healthcare system is not one or the other. I hate the term alternative medicine. That means one or the other. No, it's not true. You need both. The conventional medicine works great in areas like you have an inf infection overwhelming the body, got involved in an accident, your body's been damaged, uh, some disease has progressed so far, now that you, you, the body can't fix it anymore, you've got to take care of it. Works great in those situations. But it doesn't work well, it doesn't work very effectively at all. As a matter of fact, it probably is a detriment to the other side of the equation, which is making the body stronger help people understand why they're sick and how to become healthy. Most disease today is due to factors that are under the control of people who are sick and who need the doctors to help them understand that. Less than 20% of disease is due to genetics. All the rest, 80%, is diet, lifestyle, environment, uh, all the things that people choose. So the best doctor, from my perspective, is one who, first off, understands where the patient fits, do you need higher intervention, or do you need nurturing and health restoration? And then with that nurturing and health restoration, understand what is blocking the body from functioning properly? Do they have high levels of, for example, arsenic in the water supply? Most people don't realize that arsenic accounts for about one quarter of all cancers. Um, I, 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 I can give you an example. An example where the cause is understood, the cause is controllable, we can fix it, dramatically prevent most disease. And when people have the disease, we can reverse them. I've been involved in medicine now for literally over half a century. First as a medical researcher, then as a student in naturopathic medicine, then as a practitioner in naturopathic medicine, then as a founder of Bastyr University. Um, I, over this period of time, I've written seven books for consumers, six textbooks for doctors. I've seen uh, several thousand patients. I've also been involved in corporate wellness programs where almost 20,000 people have utilized tools I've created to help people understand why they're sick and how to become healthy. So I think I've got some pretty good insights about why people are sick. So I think about a patient, and I don't care where they are in the spectrum, whether it's they want to be, they're healthy now, want to avoid getting disease in the future, or they have a disease now, they want to reverse it, whatever the case may be. And I look at kind of three, three um, realms. You know, like, like kind of like a, a Venn diagram. In this realm here, we have a person's genetics. In this realm here, we have a person's nutritional status. In this realm here, we have their t exposure to environmental metals and toxins. And right in the middle is where people get disease, where they have a combination of genetic susceptibility and adequate nutrients for the body to function properly and being exposed to environmental toxins, so now their body is breaking down and they're getting disease. So let's talk more about what that means. Talk about genetics first. So when we look at genetics, while it is true that somewhere between 15 and 20% of disease is due to genetics, the rest of it, 80, 85%, is due to not genetics, but other factors. And even those where you have disease due to genetics, if you understand a person's biochemistry and how to use nutrition, you can often mitigate those as well. I would assert that less than 10% of disease is um, unmodifiable by living it healthily. So the vast majority of reason people are sick is under the control. So let's look at that. Let's look at first nutrition. If you look at people's nutritional status using the conventional standards, over 50% of people are deficient in one or more nutrient. Now that's what the general standards say. I did a corporate wellness program, uh, or uh, designed it and implemented it in Canada, where I looked at 4,500 
oil field workers, mainly young men, but we also have some office workers as well. And um, I tested them uh, for the nutritional status, uh, metabolic status, uh, toxin load. I did equivalent about $1,500 of lab tests on 4,500 people. So I got a chance to look at a lot of data on a lot of people. And I found that out of that 4,500 people, less than 1% were not deficient in one or more nutrients. So nutritional deficiencies were rampant. Then I looked at toxic load and most of them had toxicity. So it's very, very clear that a lot of people are in a situation where not only do they have a genetic susceptibility, but almost everybody's deficient in at least one nutrient, most people are deficient in many nutrients, and now we have an environment that's very, very toxic. So you add them all together, and the epidemic of chronic disease we're seeing throughout the world is totally explainable. I like using diabetes as, as a perfect example. So when I was in Nature Medical School half a century ago, diabetes affected less than 1% of the population. Now, 10% of the population has diabetes, and we're projecting that one third of people in the North America are gonna get diabetes in their lifetime. What happened? Did the genetics change? No. Now, if you're nutritionally oriented, you might say, well, people consume more sugar. Sugar is the cause. Well, it turns out, well, I'm not gonna say sugar, eating a lot of sugar is good for you. The excess sugar consumption started like 50 years before the diabetes epidemic started. So if sugar was causing diabetes, there ought to be a correlation. There's no correlation. Then you might say, well, how about obesity? Yep, people who are obese have dramatically more diabetes than people who are not obese. Matter of fact, you look at an obese woman in the top like 5% of obesity, they have like a 60 fold, 60 times higher risk of diabetes. Okay, but if you look at a diabetic, if you look at an obese person and look at their toxic load, you'll find that diabetes, people who are obese in the bottom 20% of environmental toxic load have no increased risk for diabetes. And you hear what I just said? Everybody knows people who are obese get diabetes, but if they're not, if they're, if they're fat, it's not full of toxins, they don't get the diabetes. So what's going on? So there's a researcher in uh, South Korea by the name of uh, Ducky Lee, who's done some great, great work here. But starting about 20 years ago, she started showing the correlation between the body load of environmental toxins, particularly things like pesticides and herbicides and things, direct correlation between the body load of these toxins and incidence of diabetes. So you start to look at this, and indeed, what these toxins do is they bind to some receptor sites. And so, because they bind to some receptor sites, our poor pancreas has to overproduce insulin to get sugar into the cell to keep us alive. Great example of how remarkably adaptive our bodies are. Even a harsh situation, Lots of toxins, we still have to some way to stay alive, but we pay a price. Because now you're over, overworking the pancreas, and after you're overworking the pancreas for 20 or 30 years, of course, it burns out now, because you worked it too hard, and now you've got diabetes. So people don't suddenly get diabetes, get work out for a long period of time. So we look at something like diabetes as a great example of a chronic disease that's increased dramatically. And by the way, most people don't realize that one out of every five healthcare dollars is spent treating people with diabetes. It's our most expensive disease. Okay, so it's a great model. So when we look at diabetes, is diabetes due to a deficiency in metformin? Okay, I'm, 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 I'm being a little facetious here, but metformin doesn't deal with the cause why people are having diabetes. So um, the, the promise and the beauty of natural medicine is that we look at the causes of diabetes. So for example, look at diabetes. I wrote a book. My latest consumer book is called The Toxin Solution. So I got a note from somebody who said, oh, you know, I've had diabetes for 15 years. I went your detoxification program. And after nine weeks, by simply detoxifying, my diabetes went away. So as we look at why people are sick, you've got to deal with the causes. And that's the problem with our current healthcare system. So much of the interventions being used only treat the symptoms of the disease. They don't treat the causes. If you look at the top 10, most commonly prescribed drugs. Go on the internet, do this yourself. Look at the drugs. Nine of the top 10 only deal with the symptoms of the disease. And I'll include in symptoms also signs of the disease, like lab tests. So for example, you get these statin drugs to decrease cholesterol levels. Well, except for people who have already had a heart attack or a stroke, statin drugs don't do much good for these people. Their cholesterol levels go down, but in terms of disease, disease incidence, 
I wrote an editorial on this about three years ago where I showed you're eight times more likely to get an adverse reaction to statin drug than a benefit from statin drug if you use them for primary prevention. Far more effective is living healthfully, getting good nutrition, avoiding toxins. One of the areas I'm most excited about in medicine right now is this modern technology we have available it helps us to much more deeply understand why people are sick and how to become healthy. So for example, now for not very much money, we can test a person's genetics. And by testing the genetics, we much better understand what the susceptibilities are. For example, arsenic. Arsenic, uh, according to the latest research that I've seen, uh, looks like it caused about one quarter of all the major cancers. Lung cancer, prostate cancer, uh, uh, pancreatic cancer. Biggest factor is arsenic. So we now have a standard where it's okay, this much of arsenic in the water supply is okay. Well, actually, it's okay or not okay depending upon a person's genetics. So arsenic is an example of a toxin we were exposed to as we evolved as a species. So we're very good at getting rid of arsenic. Half-life in the body is two to four days. But the problem is 10% of the public water supplies in the United States that have reported their arsenic levels have levels known to induce disease in humans. But here's where genetics comes in, into play. So the, the way the body gets rid of arsenic is through a two-step two process. We methylate it to something called monomethyl arsenic, which is actually eight times more toxic than arsenic. Then we do a second, second methylation to dimethyl arsenic that then gets rid of the arsenic very quickly and it's 400 times less toxic than regular arsenic. Okay, so great, get rid of it very quickly. Some people, because of genetics, get stuck in the first phase of the monomethyl arsenic. So is that very common? Well, it turns out 21% of the population has the genetics where they get stuck in the second phase. So rather than 10 micrograms of arsenic per liter of water being safe for the average population, then it's only about five. Even worse though, there are people who have a genetic poly polymorphism where they have great trouble getting rid of arsenic. So not only can they not get rid of it from, phase, from the monomethyl to the dimethyl, but they have trouble getting rid of it at all. It's only 1% of the population, but they have way greater disease susceptibility. So the beauty of our, of our world right now is we now understand arsenic does cause disease. We now understand people with certain genetic susceptibilities have way more susceptibility to damage from arsenic. Now we can understand who's got to avoid arsenic carefully, how do you facilitate the body's own mechanisms for getting rid of the arsenic, and we can dramatically increase people's health. I've now looked at, um, let me think, I've looked at 17 cancers, 21 chronic diseases, and about a little bit over 30 environmental toxins, metals and chemicals, looking at how much each of these toxins causes each of these diseases and how genetics affects it. And I can tell you, we understand genetics, nutritional status, toxic exposure. You can predict what diseases people have, and you can determine the best way to reverse that disease and get them back to health. When looking at the research that shows very clearly that most of the chronic disease epidemic throughout the world is due to environmental toxins, the next question is, what do you do about it? Okay, so number one, of course, is avoid toxins as much as possible. That means adopting a lifestyle that promotes health rather than is, you might say, the most convenient. Uh, when I write about naturopathic medicine, I talk about it <clears throat> as being more than simply a healing art, it's a way of living and being in the world. So you have to learn how to live low toxin. I mean, eat organically grown foods and low toxin health and beauty aids and take off your shoes when you enter the house, all these things you can do. The second thing we want to do is to promote the body's own natural processes for getting rid of toxins. One of the things I found that was really surprising when I was looking at how the body gets rid of mercury, I found the study showing the body gets rid of about 1% one one, 1 of the body load of mercury every day into the gut. I thought, well, that's great. Then I looked more deeply and realized then the body reabsorbs 99% of the mercury it just dumped into the gut. Why would our smart bodies waste all that metabolic energy to get rid of mercury and then just reabsorb it? It's because we sabotage the, sabotage the normal detox mechanism. As we evolved as a species, we consumed 150, I'm sorry, 100, 150 grams of fiber a day. Now the average person consumes only 15 to 20 grams of fiber a day. 
So if you want to support the body's own natural healing processes, a very simple thing to do is eat more whole foods high in fiber and even take supplemental dietary fiber so you help the body's own natural processes to get rid of the toxins. We can also facilitate the body's ability to get rid of toxins by using nutrients like N-acetylcysteine. If that causes increased production of glutathione, and glutathione plays a huge role in body detoxification. And the final process is to then look at what are the things we're doing that make our body less able to detoxify metabolically and get it working properly. So in my book, The Toxin Solution, I talk about how do you clear up your gut? How do you get your liver function properly? These are the ways we get rid of most of the toxins, get them working properly, and when we do that, as we get rid of toxins, our health improves.